Thank you for joining us again today for our online Bible study from Pine Valley Church of Christ, and we will be finishing our study of 2 Timothy today. This has been a wonderful look at the end of Paul's life, the things that he was truly concerned about, and as we looked at all the letters that he wrote in those last few years of his life, Titus, 1 Timothy, and now 2 Timothy, uh, we have seen this great focus on the importance of guarding the gospel making sure that people stay focused on what needs to be focused on and not all of these other arguments and uh, word plays that people were getting into at the time. Uh, let me bring up our slides for today. And we will continue on with looking at uh, this final letter of Paul's life. Uh, he, we will see, he will mention in chapter four here, uh, that he fully uh, expects to die soon. Uh, this is part of the prophecy God had made to Ananias about him uh, when he sent him uh, to Saul at that point in Damascus while he was blind. He told him, I will show him how much he will suffer for my gospel. And Paul did it. And he emphasizes throughout this letter that he has done it voluntarily. This is something he has given his life to because he considers himself the worst of sinners. And God's grace is so great that it would even forgive him and that he would commit himself to that. And so now as he's sort of passing the baton or the torch uh, to Timothy uh, to carry on after his death, he reminds him uh, that in his work, whether it's about his work, his ministry, his preaching, or even his own life and his faith, uh, it is important to finish the race. And it is important to stay focused on the gospel and guard it because that is what makes finishing the race worth it. Uh, that is our motivation. That is our goal. That is the finish line uh, to hang on to our faith in Jesus Christ through the gospel uh, of God as has been presented uh, here uh, by Paul at the end of his life. And he begins the chapter with uh, basically giving Timothy a, a charge or an oath. He says, if you're going to be a true minister of Jesus Christ and a faithful preacher um, who is focusing on the things that are important and remembering that as he's concluded verse chapter three, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. He says, now the beginning of chapter four, he gives Timothy this charge you know, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Here are the things you need to devote yourselves to uh, and it's in essence like he's telling him, I want you to take this oath. Here are the things to devote yourselves. And over the next few verses, there are seven imperative statements that are made in which it begins with simply preach the word. Uh, stay focused on what is the truth of the word, uh, the scripture that is God breathed. And again, remember, this is that scripture for them is the Old Testament and the gospel which had been passed on to them in oral presentations up until this time. And he's warning them about getting caught up in all these other arguments about words that are not profitable, but you make sure you are preaching the word. You're not preaching your opinion. You're not preaching uh, thoughts that come from your own interpretive process that you come up with. And that's something we struggle with uh, even today is, you know, we, come up with a system of interpretation that is developed by human beings, and then we tend to think of those, my system of interpretation is the right one, it's the best one, and may, we may even think of it as infallible if we uh, follow it that way, and that can be a dangerous trap because it's still a system based on human wisdom and not on just what the word of God explicitly teaches. And that was something that the early restoration movement 
preachers were very concerned about, and I've mentioned to you before, Thomas Campbell's uh, work on uh, making sure that we stay focused on that which was explicitly taught and not get into opinions uh, even to the point of looking at what is inferred, but that which is explicit. And uh, we've seen the same thing given to Timothy here, especially when he told him to be a straight shooter, go straightforward approach to the word, and then preach that word which you have. Be ready at all times uh, to do this work. Uh, don't hesitate, don't back off. He's already reminded him the spirit that we've been given is not one of cowardice or timidity, but one of power and love. It is something that causes us to be ready at any moment when there's an opportunity uh, to serve or to preach. He, the next three all work together as one imperative. He is to correct and rebuke and encourage. It's very similar to the uh, words he uses at the end of chapter three, talking about the word of God or scripture is valuable or it is uh, useful to these things. So you, you stay focused on the word, but that's what you use to help people better understand what they need and how to encourage them to hang on to their faith in Jesus Christ, not get caught up in all this other stuff that can uh, cause us lead us to either a sense of uh, self-righteousness or on the other side, a feeling of, well, uh, grace forgives everything so we can do whatever we want with our life. He says, no, you are to live uh, as one who is part of this new kingdom, the family of God, uh, and say no to the world and yes to godly behavior and to God himself. So, and keep your head. Uh, he's already reminded him that they, uh, he is, to anybody who disagrees with him, he is to uh, reach out and teach them patiently. And with the hopes that they will be, uh, they will turn, they will repent and turn back to God. But even then, even if they oppose him, and that this is, even if you're attacked, even if you're uh, not quite ready for it, you keep your head and you don't get uh, caught up in shouting matches or irrational uh, behavior and arguments, but you keep your head. And throughout it all, you endure hardship. Uh, that hardship can come from the outside, uh, as it had for Paul when he was in Ephesus, and the metal workers all got together and started a riot in the town because they were afraid that so many people were turning to Jesus that it was going to hurt their livelihood. And it might come from the inside, uh, like with these false teachers who were seeking to win people over to follow them uh, rather than the teachings that Paul had shared with them. Uh, we see in other places there were uh, teachers who were uh, opposing Paul, not so much that they were false teachers, but just that they thought they were more important or that people should be listening to them rather than to Paul. And Paul had endured it all. He says, I will continue to do so. And I want you to continue in the midst of all that to do the work of the evangelist. And this uh, can even go beyond just the preaching of the word. Uh, the evangelist, it's the word means you know, one who proclaims good news uh, in everything that you do. And it can be um, uh, through example. It can be through uh, speaking to someone. It can be in a counseling. It can be in prayers with people uh, you are doing. You are seeking in all that you do to share good news and proclaim that. Because, you know, you can preach the word, but you can do it, you know, within the church setting and within church walls, where it never goes outside those walls to be heard by the lost in the world. And so he makes an emphasis on that, and he concludes with, and then you fulfill your ministry. 
he's talked about uh, the elders had laid hands on him earlier on. He talks about he laid hands on him as well to receive the Holy Spirit. He has encouraged him in his work as a preacher or an evangelist. But fulfill this ministry that God has given to you, in essence, saying, just as I've already shown you that I am an example of one who is enduring to the end and doing everything that God wants me to do. And we see that in the next set of verses where uh, Paul is going to talk about his own ministry. But here in this first five verses, he says, now remember how, are, how you're supposed to do this with great patience and careful instruction. Again, you're keeping your head, you're doing it the right way, and you're doing it in the way Jesus would do it. Why? Well, in this particular setting, uh, there's already false teachers, but he says, in general, people won't listen. Uh, they're going to gather teachers around them to say what they want to say. And as I said on Sunday, this can come from either side. This can come from the legalistic side or approach to religion, which again leads to a self-righteousness like the Pharisees had and whom Jesus proclaimed, if your righteousness isn't greater than theirs, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But people who get caught up in that kind of way of thinking uh, they like being around other people who are part of that kind of thinking. They will even then go find teachers or preachers who will preach what they want to hear uh, because it makes them feel good. They don't have to think a whole lot. Uh, they just have to agree and nod their head and uh, continue to carry out judgment on other people. On the other end, people who don't want to have to live a daily life as a disciple, one who imitates Jesus, in response to the grace of God that saves us, um, they will gather teachers around them who say, that's okay, and God will forgive you. Or it, they will, if they get caught up in uh, the influences of the world around us and people telling us, well, you know, you Christians are uh, hateful, you are prejudiced, whatever words they want to use, and some people give into that and they want to sort of uh, blend in more and be more acceptable in society. And they will gather the teachers around them who think the same way and will encourage them to do that. That's why he is emphasizing so strongly to Timothy, but you do what God wants you to do. Preach the word, do the work of the evangelist, be a good example to those around you. Because he says, I am the example that I am laying out before you. I am already being poured out like a drink offering. If you go back to Numbers 28 and 29, there is a long list of uh, sacrifices and rituals and festivals that are held throughout the year. And in every single one of them, including the daily sacrifice uh, that was put on at the temple, there would be a meat offering, there would be a grain offering, and there would be a drink offering, uh, which would usually be wine, and it would be as the uh, meat and grain offerings are burned up, then it, the drink offering would be poured out on it. It was as if to say we are, we are sacrificing every part of a meal or the things that we use to exist in this world back to God who has provided all that for us. And it was done on a daily basis in the morning and every evening. And Paul compares his life to, and his ministry to, I've done that. I have given it all. I have poured out my life as an offering to God for what he has given me through his love and mercy and grace. He says, because I know my departure is near. And I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. All of these are uh, more athletic type terms that he uses uh, from the Greek rather than military. Uh, in the Greek games, you know, wrestling was a big part of that. 
You know, he fought the good fight. He has hung on. He has finished the race. He didn't give up. Uh, there are many times I'm sure he thought about it or wondered, is this really worth it? Especially when he had been stoned and drug outside of Lystra and left for dead. But he has continued on. He has been imprisoned. He has been beaten. He has been harassed. And he has kept the faith. Because he fully understands the kind of sinner he was, even as a quote unquote righteous Pharisee or a righteous Jew. And he still understood just what kind of grace it took for God to reach out to him, one who was persecuting the early church, to offer him mercy and grace and to forgive him and to be part of his life and guide him through the end. And he finished it while keeping the faith. And there is the example, not only for Timothy, but for all Christians. Are we willing to put this kind of effort into remaining faithful to God through Jesus for the rest of our lives? And that's easier, more easily done if we stay focused on the gospel. And if we guard the gospel, not just in terms of what is taught in our churches, but we guard it within our own lives and in our heart. And we make sure we don't get caught up in uh, irrelevant religious arguments. We don't get caught up in the influence of the world around us. But we seek to finish the race and keep the faith, not knowing when our time will come, but we know it will come. And he knows that I will receive a crown. There is, there is a reward for everybody who finishes the race. And that is something he is looking forward to because he longs for his appearing. Uh, there was a great expectation in the early church uh, that Jesus would come back ex very soon. Uh, by this point, over 30 years has passed since he was taken up into heaven. Some may have been uh, already you know, giving up because they, well, you know, we thought he was coming back. Well, apparently he's not. And of course, now, 2,000 years later, it's very simple, easy for people just to, well, you know, he hasn't come for 2,000 years. He may be 2,000 more before he comes. But there's a different way of looking at life and approaching it when we long for his appearing. We want him to come, and we want him to come soon. Consequently, I will be ready so that we can say we have fought the fight, we've finished the race, we've kept the faith. And we will receive that same reward that Paul is looking forward to in his own life. But it's because there is that longing, there is that desire, and that motivates us to do this. In the final verses of his letter, as he does in so many of his, he comes but you know, sort of review some things, uh, things that help make his point. Uh, give some final details of things that are going on. And it's interesting to see some of them. And he talks about uh, different kinds of individuals in this group. There are the disloyal, uh, which uh, the first the one mentioned is in verse nine. Uh, Come to me quickly, or verse 10, for Demas, because he has loved this world, has deserted me, and has gone to Thessalonica. Um, Maybe Thessalonica was his hometown. We don't know why he went that particular place, but uh, he has left Paul because of his love for this world. And it's interesting, Paul uses agape in terms of his love for this world. Uh, John does the same thing in 1 John uh, chapter 2. Uh, don't love this world. And we tend to think of agape as only something that is about a selfless love and uh, giving to others. Uh, it's about something you give yourself to completely. And we can do that to the world uh, rather than to Jesus and to each other. And so, you know, if we get caught up in that kind of love for the world, uh, we will leave because we can't serve two masters. 
And it's such a sad verse because Demas is mentioned in the end of Colossians and in Philemon, uh, both letters written at the end of uh, Paul's last imprisonment in Rome when he was there for the two years under house arrest. And he's mentioned as a fellow worker. And yet now, a few, couple of years later, because of his love for this world, he has left him. There are many loyal and they're continuing on doing their work. Uh, he mentions uh, Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus, who has been, of course, in Crete, he's gone to Dalmatia, uh, which is right across uh, from Italy in what is now uh, Croatia. Uh, only Luke is with me. Uh, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me with my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus, and you know, it just, there's all these people that have gotten involved in this work, and they have remained loyal, not just to Paul, but to the gospel, and are doing and going wherever they need to go to continue that work. Uh, but there's also the enemies. He talks about Alexander the metal worker in verse 14 uh, was strongly against their message. Uh, apparently someone in Ephesus who is a metal worker, or uh, the word can actually mean coppersmith. Uh, this is, he could have been one of the ones that were part of that riot uh, in Ephesus earlier. Uh, but he, this particular Alexander uh, doesn't seem to be referred to anywhere else. But Timothy knows who he is because he's being warned about him and says, you know, he did great damage, uh, a great deal of harm. And verse 15, you should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed us. So there's still always going to be enemies out there. But the one who has always been by his side, even those uh, uh, who had deserted him at his first events, verse 16, but 17, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God is always up my side. He has been through me, with me, even through the persecutions, and has delivered me from the lion's mouth. Some see that as a reference to uh, Psalm 22, uh, where it refers to uh, the lions with their mouths open or around me. And of course, Psalm 22, the first verse of that is, or the first phrase is quoted by Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, but it ends up as a psalm of victory by the end because God delivers him. Uh, I think more directly, there is a reference to Daniel chapter six where or he is, uh, falsely accused, as Paul often was, he is thrown into the lion's den, uh, and the king, who respects him greatly, shows up the next day uh, after telling him he would pray that his God would deliver him, and he calls out to Daniel and says, has your God, whom you serve constantly, saved you? And he calls back, yes. Uh, he sent his angels, and they closed the lion's mouths, and I am not harmed because I am innocent. And I think this is the way Paul sees God helping all of us spiritually. He keeps the enemy away from us where he can't uh, devour us. In fact, will bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom. That is his promise. If we remain faithful and we finish the race, he's going to be with us all the way, encouraging us, helping us, empowering us. And we'll keep uh, the devil from being able, or the lions around us, uh, from being able to devour us. And we will go home. So in a quick look back over uh, all three letters, uh, the two to Timothy and the one to Titus, as he is focused throughout on the importance of guarding the gospel. He has given us different summary statements throughout, and I wanted to take one final look at that to make sure 
we remember because when we start talking about the gospel, sometimes all sorts of things get added on as to what is a matter of faith or salvation or what is uh, gospel and a lot of, you know, here is what Paul has focused on throughout all three letters. The gospel is that because of the kindness, love, and mercy of God, Jesus came to save sinners. And he has redeemed all who believe as he was raised from the dead, by which he destroyed death and revealed eternal life. He has saved us by grace through faith and the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is an eternal reward for all who endure to the end. There is the essence of it. Uh, very much similar to his uh, short sermon that he gave and the, on the Acropolis in Athens. Now, the, this is all about God and what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ, and his uh, saving sacrifice, the redemption, the purification that we receive from him by grace through faith, not by anything that we do, and the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And where uh, baptism is never specifically mentioned by that name uh, in the Gospels, uh, the idea of this washing of rebirth is. But it also reminds us that it's not because we go and are dunked in water. It's still when we repent and come to him and express our faith in our desire to be baptized in the name of Jesus, he provides for us a washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Again, it's what God does. And there is an eternal reward for all who endure to the end. And he's emphasized uh, to us how we need to respond. There needs to be belief or we have faith in Jesus and uh, that we're willing to confess and say no to ungodliness. We will truly repent. And the confession was the idea of truly wanting to say before everyone around you, this is now what I believe and what I give my life to. It's not just a, a set phrase uh, to be said at a time or a prayer. It is part of this action that we take to say no to ungodliness and yes to God, which leads to us then making that uh, proclamation physically in baptism, where we receive the rebirth of the washing away of our sins and the renewal through the Holy Spirit, uh, which is promised to all Christians to go on and live godly lives, to do good. Uh, as he mentioned at the end of Titus, our people need to understand the importance of devoting themselves to doing good because of how much good it will do for the gospel of Jesus Christ in a sinful world around us. And we must endure. We must hang on to the very end, staying focused on what is most important and not getting caught up in all the uh, distractions around us, religious or not, worldly or not. All of them can be distractions to staying focused on what we need to live godly lives and endure to the end and finish the race and receive that crown which God has promised us in his son, Jesus. And so we make sure that like Timothy and Titus and Paul, we will guard the gospel, not only in our teaching, in our churches, uh, but also in our hearts. It is what we will believe and it's what we will live by and it is what we will then proclaim to the world around us, either by example or in the teaching and the example and the outreach, the doing of good uh, that we share with the world around us. I've enjoyed going through this study with you and I hope it has been a benefit to you. And next week we begin looking at those final words of Jesus to his disciples in the upper room as they are recorded by uh, the Apostle John in John chapters 13 through 17. 
he includes teachings here that are not included in any of the other gospels. And I think it's important that we conclude the year. Now, we've heard from uh, Peter, we've heard from Solomon, we've heard from Paul this year as they reflect at the end of their lives. Now to close out the year by looking at what are the things Jesus says on that last night before his crucifixion to his disciples that he wants them to remember that would help them get through uh, the next several days and continue on and then become uh, committed to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is about to show them through his sacrifice for them and for us. So that's where we'll be going in the weeks to come. I look forward to sharing that with you. And until then, may God keep us all safe and healthy and see you next week.